Hello folks, welcome back to World War II TV and we are continuing our look at the Pacific Campaign. Today, in fact, we are off the Guadalcanal, Peleliu and beyond to learn about the colourful life of an old breed general. Joining me are Amy and Don, links to their book and their website can be found as I can all the information you need in the description below. But that was enough for uh, introduction, we've got two guests tonight so I'm going to steam straight into the show. So good afternoon Amy and Don, how are the two of you today? Very well, very well. Doing very well, um, Paul. Thanks so much for having us. We appreciate the great work you're doing. Looking forward to discussing General Reporters here in the next few minutes. So thank you. Thank you. So quickly, for the benefit of the viewers, Amy first, then Don, quick little 30-second, one-minute sketch of how you, who you are, how you came to this project, and, and wh why you wrote the book. So Amy first. All right. Okay, so uh, General Rupertus is our grandfather. Uh, I have two sisters. Uh, we are the granddaughters of General Rupertus, and he's got a fascinating life, but his story was never told uh, for whatever reason. He died, he, well, he died in 1945. Uh, so we decided to go ahead and get it done, and Don really is the inspiration because he was researching another book when he discovered our grandfather. And we've always thought it was a pretty cool story, but we, you know, kicked the can down the road. And it was Don who kind of spurred me to get this down before it was too late. So that was about seven years ago. And uh, so now we have the book out and we're in Charlotte, North Carolina. Brilliant, thank you. And Don, your, your background? Uh, Paul, as you, as you know, I'm an ex US Naval officer, or specifically a Naval JAG officer. Did five years active, 11 in the reserve, 16 altogether. Then began writing military books, and uh, Obrey General is the 15th book that I've been involved in writing. It's my first co-author experience, and I could not have been more pleased. Matter of fact, I was trying to avoid co-author experiences, but uh, Amy and I got together. I was working on a book called Last Fighter Pilot, which is uh, another World War II book about Captain Jerry Yellen, who had flown the final combat mission of World War II, and was interviewing, actually researching China and the background of the China Burma Theater and the and the Shanghai Massacre and and all that, and saw a picture of, of General Rupertus uh, in one of my research materials and knew that Amy's maiden name was Rupertus. And I just sent her, a, I'd known her from some functions, and sent her an email. Is, are you kin to this guy? She said, yes. One thing led to another, and here we are being interviewed from Paris. And uh, so we're happy, happy to be able to bring the story. And thanks again for having us. Brilliant. Well, it's great to have you. And Obviously, the fact you're still talking, it was that the writing process was obviously very successful. I do know authors who fell out during the writing process and have never spoken to each other since. But as usual, you've come armed with a PowerPoint that Amy's in charge of today. Folks, we're going to do the questions at the end today. But if there is an absolutely vital one that you really want to know the answer to as we're going along about something on screen, please fire away. But basically, hold off all your big ones for the end and uh, just hopefully we don't go on too long and, and, and Don has to leave the airport there but anyway i'm gonna hand over to amy to take us through this story and don will jump in and um let's learn more about this incredible character and my point just as a as a, as a brit is that with the u.s marine corps growing up in britain there were a few big names we heard about but after those big names it they drop down very quickly in familiarity i think that's generally how it goes certain people just had better press so to speak and we talk about them all the time and other people who did equally exciting and amazing things just seem to be in that second third or 75th tier of fame but we'll hopefully learn a lot more tonight so over to you amy let's go through the presentation all right well thank you well this story is uh, of course about our grandfather but it's really a story about the uh uh the marines and the war in the pacific and how it started and you know how it played out so uh, we'll go through this. And like you said, if there's any questions that you need to ask right away, um, go ahead, but we'll try to get through this presentation pretty quickly. All right. So um, our grandfather is, uh, his name is William Henry Rupertus. He wrote uh, something called My Rifle, the Creed of a United States Marine, which also is known as the Rifleman's Creed that has been recited since really 1942 when he wrote it up until, you know, a couple years ago. And it's been in movies and videos and that sort of thing. Uh, he did two tours in China, once in P uh, for your audience, and not, I'm assuming most of them know about the international settlements, settlements that were in P China. So the 4th Marines were there, 4th Marine Regiment were there to pr protect the American sector of the international settlements. And he was there in Peking and in Shanghai. Um, about seven years apart. 
He also led the first Marine division in the Pacific, slightly longer than um, any other division commander. And uh, right after he died, the US in 1945, the USS Rupertus was named in his honor, um, which was a destroyer, which served our country from the United States from 1945 to uh, 1973, and then was sold to Greece. Uh, and she served for quite a lot longer uh, there too. Um, but his story has never been told until now. So here we go. Um, really, if you back in the story, his story, his Pacific story really starts back in China because that's where as, um, let me turn off this email, I'm sorry. That's where in Marine Corps history, he, he met his future foe. So his first tour of duty in Peking uh, was fairly calm. Uh, it ended with a sad chapter because scarlet fever swept through Peking and his whole family died. His wife was there and um, his two children, his wife, Marguerite was 38, his son was 14 and his daughter was four and they all phew, died of scarlet fever. So that was a huge tragedy. Um, he left Peking in 1931. Uh, right after that, the Japanese um, uh, bombed Manchuria in 1931, and he's probably reading this back in, in the States. And then 1932, uh, they bomb uh, Shaipei, uh, which is a suburb of Shanghai, killing almost a thousand people. So he fast forward, he comes back, he marries my grandmother and uh, has a number of other duty stations, but the Marine Corps sends him back to China in 1937. He brings my grandmother. And so he was there when the Japanese, so they've been you know, moving along. And then in July, 1937, I think your audience knows they, they, we had the incident in the Marco Polo Bridge. And then in August, 1937, while our grandfather was with the 4th Marines protecting the Shanghai International, the American sector of the Shanghai International Settlement, um, the Japanese bombed the city. And the city of Shanghai at the time was about 3 million people, very international. Everybody went on alert. About 400,000 um, refugees came flooding into the international settlement for safety. Uh, the Marines here that here they are obviously trying to come up with a plan of action. Um, they had set up barricades of sandbags all around the American sector. I'm sure every nation's other nation's guards did that were in the foreign settlement, um, international settlement. And then they had over 50 strong points um, ready for action. But here are some pictures that our grandfather took or someone took and gave him um, of some of the, the devastation that was happening right before the Marines' eyes. And they were along this perimeter and they were told not to fire. The Marines were said, you know, it was said, hold your fire, do not fire, D don't let any belligerents in and don't fire. So meanwhile, the Marines were, you know, on their perimeter ready for anything, but from the highest echelon, America was not ready to go with, to war with Japan in 1937. But the Marines and Naval officers that were here during the time witnessing these atrocities and this behavior and the daily executions and the stray bullets and shrapnel coming into on their bodies, um, they wrote home and they told the uh, headqu their headquarters and their friends um, back at the headquarters that we are witnessing something we've never seen before. And if we don't do something here in Shanghai to manage the Japanese threat, they will come to our shores. And this was in 1937. So... Um, and in fact, Admiral Yarnell, who was the head of the uh, Shanghai uh, people there, Marines there in the Navy, um, he wrote a huge, a long letter about that this would be a war that he could predict and we, it would be a naval war and uh, this is how, and exactly how it might play out. And that was in 1938. So fast forward, December 7th, 1941, they did come to our shores. Uh, and, and the uh, bombing Pearl Harbor, which launched us into uh, World War II. So we finally joined uh, World War II, but it was through the Japanese. Um, 
And I'm sure a lot of these uh, naval officers and Marines who witnessed this behavior of the Japanese in China were um, not shocked, but ready to go. And so our grandfather at the time was uh, head of the Marine Corps base San Diego, but he was called to join the 1st Marine Division under his friend, uh, General Vandergriff. And right about that time, our grandfather was an expert rifleman and he had been on the rifle team. He had been a rifle and pist pistol instructor and he knew he had met the Japanese. He'd seen them at their worst in China. And um, he knew that these young Marines, all these thousands of Marines, young people that were getting into the Marine Corps were going to meet this enemy, this battle-tested enemy and in the jung jungles of the Pacific. So he wrote something called My Rifle, The Creed of United States Marine. And I, I think he was actually asked to write it um, or write something that would give them some mojo because at the end of the day, they would land on the islands with their rifle, a bayonet, a canteen, a knife, or, you know, not much. So their rifle was really important to saving their lives and helping to win the ground battle. So um, the Rifleman's Creed is here and I can recite it later if anybody would like me to. Um, it's really a beautiful poem uh, written for war. So um, John, do you wanna, right here is the situation map we're looking at <laughs> and it, it's similar to what we're kind of, a little bit what we're seeing right now, but, um, and a smaller scale, but this is what we were looking at. I mean, J Japan was on the offense and they were winning and uh, we were not looking uh, too good. But sure enough, the uh, 1st Marine Division was gearing up uh, in New River, North Carolina, and they were going to, by May and June, cross the uh, uh, United States and get on boats and hit the Pacific and land in New Zealand, invade New Zealand, over 13,000 Marines descended on New Zealand. And uh, that was by June or July, they, J July, they were all there. And then they had to turn around with very little time, very little training and be on Guadalcanal and Tulagi by August 7th, uh, 1942. I just want to jump in and bring Don in if he doesn't mind. And I, I wanted yeah. to particularly ask as our, as our Navy vet there is that the time period you're talking about there, Amy, that late 1930s period, one of the, recurring themes on his channel is that military hierarchies, the existing generals and commanders and admirals, often they're thinking about the past wars and they're not being visionary enough to see the future wars. It seems to me, Amy, that your grandfather was 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 seeing things in the future. So and so Don, for you to, to you as someone who served there, is that generally a, a, a situation that still exists? Is too many people in command thinking about the past and not enough about the future? I think that's very much true. And, uh, you know, as you know from a World War II historian yourself, Paul, there's been a lot of debate historically as to when did World War II start. If you ask an American, you'll hear December 7th. You ask a Brit, you'll probably hear September 139. But you ask uh, someone in China and maybe the Chinese invasion of Manchuria. But we were very clearly warned about uh, Chinese aggression. And General Pertus, who is one of the most historical uh, historically significant generals in all of World War II, and this is the first major work on him, was uniquely positioned to later take command of the 1st Marine Division. And he commanded the 1st Marine Division in the Pacific longer than any other general. But he saw that very clearly. They tried to send, the, the, the officers on the ground tried to send messages up the chain of command, but for a number of reasons, they were ignored. Uh, as, you, as you know, there was a lot of isolationist uh, power within the United States political power. Um, Roosevelt himself was uh, involved in, in depression era politics and, uh, and and Prime Minister Churchill was pushing the United States even to get involved. And so the United States kind of got involved. Uh, yes, Pearl Harbor was the wake up call, but had largely been ignoring Japanese movements. I mean, if you stop and think about it, in, Man in Shanghai, for example, in 1937, you have more Chinese slaughtered over a period of four months. We, we had half of them, about 200,000 Chinese slaughtered. The United States, by contrast, lost around 400,000 men. And I'm not counting British losses, but it's the U.S. alone, 400,000 men in World War II. So you had half the number 
of people slaughtered in the four month period in Shanghai in 1937 as the United States would lose over a four year period, which shows the real intensity and seriousness of what was happening in this part of the world. So to answer your question, yes, I think Western leadership was largely to a degree asleep at the wheel. You mentioned a, a little earlier that uh, only a few Marine Corps generals are really all that well known. Part of, and part of the issue here is frankly that, and there's, there's a lot of reason for this, but most of World War II history is largely focused on the European theater. That's in large because the US, Britain and France have been very close allies. Two of our close allies from an American standpoint, you know, France had been overwritten and Britain was being bombed, you know, and, uh, and God bless the Royal Air Force even this day. But so that has seen more of a historical focus. And so um, we're hoping that this book is going to try to cover some of that gap. But to your original question, yes, I think we were asleep with the wheel. We should have listened to our guys on the ground. We didn't do it. And uh, now it's all history. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Don. Well, back to you, Amy. Okay. So, um, you know, and even... Well, I can go into the China stuff for a long time, but we're here to talk about World War II. So um, basically, our grandfather, again, left uh, San Diego, went across the country, joined the 1st Marine Division in something that used to be called Tent City. It really was a tent city. I have old pictures from it, um, but it's in it's Camp Lejeune uh, now, or Lejeune, the proper way to say it. Uh, uh, but he was there for the formation and training of the 1st Marine Division, but really training the infantry. And um, again, by, so that was March, by May, General Vandergriff, the, lot, I don't know if a lot of people know, but they had, because there was a world war going on, there weren't enough transports to ship the Marines at all the same time. So General Vandergriff took the first echelon and they went around the Panama Canal our grandfather took the second echelon of Marines and they went across the United States by train and then got on a, um, got on transports from uh, San Francisco. So again, our grandfather was the second echelon and they arrived, um, you know, in July and they had to literally turn around because the joint chiefs had moved up the timetable and they really, some of them couldn't even get off the ships. Uh, after this long voyage, I'm sure they were, the Marines were ready to revolt, but um, they, the time was turned up and they needed to get to on Guadalcanal by August 7th and Tulagi. So um, uh, it was a crazy time, but they, they got it done. Don, you want to pick up here? I'm glad to, but somebody's going to have to move the PowerPoint for me because I don't have control over it. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. So, so let me see the next one. Um, this is a little background on what's happened in in the Pacific uh, in late 1941, er, early 1942. Of course, it started with Pearl Harbor, then the Japanese moved into the Philippines, and then these British controlled areas of Singapore and Malaysia, and basically had wrestled total control of the Western Pacific. And so if you want to keep moving that, Amy, I'll, I'll try to keep up with it. But the bottom line is that um, there, there's an example of the Bataan death march. And think about the date of this. April 1942, General Ring Wright surrenders you know, 75,000 combined U.S. and Filipino forces, arguably the largest defeat, certainly in the modern history of the U.S. Army, sending General MacArthur, of course, um, you know, off of Corregidor and eventually to Australia, where he held out for most of the war. So go right ahead, Amy, if you want. So, so, uh, and then, of course, there have been very few uh, battles that we've had success in, at least in the Pacific. As a matter of fact, one of the things that we'll get to in a moment is historically significant about General Rupertus. He commanded the first American victory in all World War II, maybe even the first Allied victory. When you count the Soviets in, maybe they had some victories, but at least in terms of the British and the French, it's the first victory on the ground. But leading up to this, what was happening is um, we were losing here, losing there. In May 1942, the U.S. Navy steps in, and therefore in at Coral Sea, there's basically a stalemate. And then we fast forward to Midway. You got that slide, Amy, in June of 1942. That was a great strategic victory by the U.S. Navy. Um, some say the hand of God intervened. It was amazing when you look at uh, the number of Japanese carriers that were sunk, basically decapitating the Japanese carrier fleet, although they remained very lethal as a naval force with their heavy cruisers, as we see later when they came into the slot. But that was a major strategic turning point, which still we had not begun to push them back in the famous island campaign. Amy, if you want to go ahead and move that, you can. And whenever you want to jump in, you can. Um, this is a slide that basically shows um, the battles 
that the general was involved in that are historically significant. There are four, I would argue. First, there was Tulagi. That's in the Solomon Islands, right across what we call Iron Bottom Channel from Guadalcanal. <laughs> and uh, that was the first American victory captured by those Marines. You know, Tulagi had been the, the you know, the head of, of the British um, Solomon Islands, the, you know, the, the the capital basically had been there. It was a deep water port. The British uh, had withdrawn from there in early 1942 because the Japanese military presence was so heavy. They'd taken that and they had seaplanes there and communications facilities. You had to take that in order to later go into Guadalcanal. The general and his first Marines did that. Then he fought and commanded the final battle at Guadalcanal. That is the Battle of Henderson Field. Uh, and, uh, you know, General Vandegrift had left the island. He'd gone to New Caledonia. Uh, to argue for more resources for the Marines, the Japanese engineered a surprise attack. This is the battle where the great Marine John Bessalone won the Medal of Honor. But after this battle, the Japanese backs were basically broken on Guadalcanal. Then we have the Battle of uh, Cape Blaster in New Britain. Uh, and of course, uh, New Britain, uh, you, you've got, you know, the Japanese are over. They've got their base over on one side. We came on the other. And then finally, the Battle of Peleliu, which is the final battle, one of the bloodiest, by the way, battles up to that point because the Japanese changed their strategy uh, there rather than going deep into the woods they came out and attacked on the beaches and were dug into the island and we would see this in the remaining ground battles of World War II including Okinawa and and Iwo Jima and then ok Okinawa before uh, the drop the bomb was dropped so very significant military commander which these are covered in the book as well and you can move it if you want um, mm -hmm. move that screen let me see what we've got. So this is this is we're setting the scene now, August seventh, nineteen forty-two. This is what you're seeing here is the the arrow is showing um, the Allied uh, naval task force that is moving north uh, from as it, as originally New Zealand in toward the Solomon Islands. You can see the Solomon Islands there, and uh, there there are two subcomponents: the Marines, one by the overall commander, General uh, Archie Vandegrift, and the other by General Purtis. And so and so. Um, the Japanese are controlling all this area. And if you look at this from a strategic standpoint, part of the problem is um, by this point, August of 42, the Japanese have lost their carriers. But you can see where Australia is. So they're looking for islands from which to launch airstrikes and naval strikes against Australia. Of course, they hit Darwin pretty hard in there. But so you got to basically start pushing back into Solomon Islands to begin the island hopping campaign up to the north and to the west. Amy, go ahead and move that again if you would. This little closer view from what we saw before, you saw that, that black area. What you're seeing now is Guadalcanal Island, which, you know, from the air looks a little bit like the state of California almost, which is much, much larger. And so the task force comes in and the task force is going to is going to turn approximately uh, 95 degrees or so and move in the Sealark Channel. And you can see Savo Island there, which is the site of some of the bloodiest, bloodiest naval battle after World, after Pearl Harbor. But uh, the approach is for the U, the task force commanded by General Rupertus to first strike at Tulagi, which is the top arrow there going to the right before General Vandegrift takes his Marines into Guadalcanal. Go ahead, Amy. Again, a little closer, a little closer. This is Task Force Yoke, which was commanded by uh, General Rupertus, Task Force Extra by by um, General Vandegrift. If you look there at Guadalcanal, you can see a little airstrip that's being shown. That airstrip, the Japanese were building. We took it and renamed it Henderson Field, but it was being built at the time. This is why this Guadalcanal was so was so important to control that airfield and to control the real estate all around it. So, uh, but you got to take out Tulagi first because they have seaplanes and they have all types of things that can actually have sunk a lot of the task force if not interdicted. Go ahead, Amy. Yeah, um, I think one thing when I was researching this, what I was so surprised is, first of all, a lot of people uh, don't know that the Marines split transports and that they not all the Marines went to uh, Guadalcanal. And they're, so they did split transports. Obviously, they hit, they hit Tulagi uh, under our grandfather, but there are also a number of, you know, Marines that died there. So to, it's important to remember them that fought and died there. So. Right. Um, and that, that Tulagi, again, Paul, is the first American victory, the first Western Allied victory of the, of the war. A, again, the Soviets may have had something on the ground, which I'm not comparing, but I'm talking about between the Americans and the Brits. It's the first ground victory of the war there at Tulagi Island, which makes it historically significant. And that's where the air, the aircraft and the airstrips were. That had to be cleared out in order to later take Guadalcanal. If you've seen um, Spielberg's The Pacific series, I don't know if you have or not, that they depict 
the beginning days of Guadalcanal as it was. But Tulagi is, this is the first book to talk about Tulagi. It was a bloody affair. When the Marines came on board in Guadalcanal, when they when they entered the shore, they entered the shore without opposition because the Japanese were using what I call a, a retreat and regroup type of strategy. They're moving back into the into the into the woods and the jungles to come out and counterattack later. Uh, so this is the first book that is Obrey General that goes into detail in the Battle of Tulagi. So we're very proud of that. And by the way, um, Amy has done. Um, uh, the entire Western world, a, a, a great service because she has been repository of her grandfather's military records. In fact, he had a very detailed diary of the Battle of Tulagi and even beyond that, which we were able to use. You know, she said the U.S. National World War II Museum, the Reagan, she's had all kinds of, of, of major archives, wanted to get the general's diary. But this is first source of information. And he went into a lot of detail. So what we're writing, we're, we're using a literary nonfiction style to write the book. But the, but the, uh, I mean the, 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 the chronology of the events and details are all, all marked because Amy's grandfather took great, great diary and great notes. And we were able to use that a lot. So this is Tulagi Island. It's three and a half miles in long. It's about six tenths of a mile. At it's widest point. If you see uh, the the red arrow, that's where the U.S. Marine Raiders first made contact. Now General Curtis, I don't know what our next, what's our next slide there? I mean I can't remember. General Curtis executed a very daring, daring military maneuver here. Now, listen, this was also the first, uh, not only was the first victory, but it was the first amphibious uh, attack by Allied forces. And so if you look at Tulagi Island here, what you can't see here is that from the upper left of the island down to the lower right, there's kind of, imagine a horseshoe surrounding the outside and the waters there. That horseshoe is like very, very dangerous coral. And so the Japanese were congregated the lower right, expecting the attack from the lower right part of the island where their forces were. The general ordered a daring, uh, you know, effort where his Marines would actually jump overboard outside the coral and wade in. And, and to surprise the Japanese, they came from the backside. I think we made some photographs of that. Amy, move on if you would there. And Amy, whenever you want to jump back in, just let me know. Yeah, this is a uh, picture of our grandfather and uh, right off of Tulagi. This is actually in the Pacific and a couple other movies is seen, but, uh, and then this is his chief of staff, Colonel Car Kilmartin here. Um, and one thing I wanted to say, Dave Holland um, gave us, or gave me uh, a great um, book he found about a, a coast watcher who was um, with my grandfather uh, on Tulagi. And he had lived in, um, lived on the island for over four years. So he knew the waterways around there and he was hugely resourceful. Um, I think the name of the book is Kisco, but uh, Dave can uh, let you know, or we can talk about it later, but um, fascinating story. But he probably- I'm going to jump in there, Amy, because yeah. strangely enough, we have a show about Coast Watchers on Monday with the Australian historian, Michael Veach is coming on to talk about the whole Coast Watcher project. So well, well plugged there, Amy, good job. Yeah, well, he, this book was fascinating. I mean, what they went through, um, but they, he was, you know, assigned to Rupertus and he really helped, I think, um, help them navigate some of these tough decisions, like about where the coral is and where it was okay to. Uh, and another like, question for you, Amy, before I hand it back to you is, is, you know, you, you know, Don just said about how you, you are the holder of all these family archives. I'm going to say this in a very gentle way, but Marines are often known for being a bit focused on what they do and not maybe the bigger picture because they're Marines. Right. I would, I would, I would include British Royal Marines in that as well. Yeah. With your grandfather's archives, was he good at seeing the global picture? I mean, you talk about him being in China because I always make the point on this channel that the Japanese saw the Solomon Islands and the New Guinea campaign as one. We Westerners tend to divide it. The Aussies are in New Guinea, the Americans in Guadalcanal. Right. But your grandfather, does he kind of have a good grasp of the bigger picture or is he kind of focused on that, what his own unit are doing? No, I think he knew very well that, I mean, especially from his diary, that he was working with uh, the Army um, and, of course, the Navy. And thank goodness I brought Don in because he, he helped us bring in more Navy to this book. Because I was focused on the Marines, but um, and and Australians, so um, and the British too. So yeah, he knew they were there, and he wrote about them in their, his diary and that sort of thing. So yeah, definitely he was he was especially I think after his experience in China, he was pretty resolute, um, and he knew that you know we all needed it. Everybody needed to work together. So brilliant. Well, I'll hand it back to you too. 
I'm, I'm loving it so far. So keep okay. going. Well, the general was, uh, I, I can follow up on that. He was very much, he was multilingual. Uh, when he landed on, when they finally took Tulaga, he actually opened up a diplomatic liaisons with the locals. So he understood all that. What we're seeing here are photographs of U.S. Uh, Marine Raiders waiting on floor, on the on the shore. Now, if you can imagine just outside of this picture, there is a, they're breaker race. They're, they're uh, breakers with, with coral. And, and so we brought the Higgins boats up basically to the to the edge of that. These guys had to jump out. A lot of times the water comes over their head or up their necks, and it's kind of a treacherous thing. But but this was done again to achieve surprise. They they congregate and then move down the peninsula and hit the Japanese from the back. It was a really brilliant and daring mover maneuver. If it had gone bad, it would have been another story. But it was put off brilliantly. It really was. Amy, here we go. Okay. So we should, yeah. So this is this is again as a, a battle the battle lines of two of Tulagi and Tanambogo, which is which are islets just off to the right of Tulagi. <clears throat> and we, you see where the Marines hit at what time they hit. They move in at uh, 8 o'clock on the 7th, and then by, at noon, a second group of Marines moves into Gavatu. Uh, Tulagi would fall the next day, August the 8th, Gavatu on August the 9th. And so the interesting thing here is that, uh, you know, August the 9th, of course, uh, was, was three years to date before the bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, August 6th. Of course, this is the timing is really interesting, I think, uh, of this entire operation. They're moving in on August the 6th, which is a kind of a prelude of things to come. Um, a photograph here of Tulagi burning from a U.S. Navy fo photo on the um, D-Day. You can see the Marines are coming from the left to the right. This is Tanambogo, which is the islet again, which is also a seaplane base, which was uh, hit by U.S. Uh, Marine Parachute Battalion. First time they've been in action, that battalion has since dismanded, but that was a bloody... Uh, affair as well. The Japanese were dug in very, very deep, but that fell on the 9th of August. Go ahead, Amy. Right. And the parachute bat battalion, people think, oh, parachutes, like they, they in Europe, but they couldn't do it. It was not safe to have them land that way. So they become, you know, they were boots on the ground. That's exactly right. The terrain would not allow for that. Yeah. And the island wasn't big enough. Yeah. So, and again, this is, this is uh, Tanambogo, which we saw. There's a land bridge there that connects the two parts. So, excuse me, this is Gavitu. There's a, uh, a land bridge that connects the two, two parts of that. And you can see the land bridge there. And um, it's a photograph. Amy, you want to, this is your grandfather. Yeah, so this, this picture says the Leatherneck officers um, who control <clears throat> Kalagi. And our grandfather's there. Um, uh, Colonel Edson's there. And uh, Kilpatrick. And just the, that's the Tulagi uh, officers. <laughs> And yeah, so this, this is. Go ahead, Amy. You take it. Go ahead. Again, when I was researching this, you know, we didn't learn this. I don't know about you. I didn't learn about the Pacific in uh, college or high school. The war in the Pacific. So this this naval battle really just shocked me and saddened me when I read about it and researched it. Um, but Don, you can be the Navy guy. Why don't you get into this? Earlier, and I know you know this, Paul, but but after Midway the Japanese carriers were decapitated. So it, it took away their ability to project air power, but they remained extremely dangerous to their cruisers and destroyers. And so they were coming down this area called the slot, um, all from all the way down the slot into the Solomon Islands. And look at the date here. The date here is August 8th. This is D-Day plus one. This is the date that this, Tulagi has fallen earlier in the day. Um, Gavitu Island will fall the next day. But we had stationed U.S., primary U.S. and Royal Australian uh, cruisers and frigates in, in three areas around Guadalcanal and Tulagi, basically to protect the Marines' landing. The Japanese were much more proficient at night battle. So they come in at night, basically surprise the Allied forces, and, and it turns into a colossal disaster. You can see three cruisers sunk, one scuttled, you know, over a thousand American, American sailors to the bottom of the water of the, of the ocean. This is this was a. Uh, originally called the Sea Lark Channel, after this battle is now known as Iron Bottom Sound because there's so many ships that get sunk there. And again, it's one of those grace of God things, but the Japanese could theoretically, could theoretically have come on in and attacked. The, the Marines now are basically, are largely defenseless to a degree. They're unloading from these transports. The Japanese turned around and went back. They went back north to New Britain, to their base up there. But, um, <clears throat> but yeah, let me yeah, jump, go ahead. jump yeah. in. So, um, First, most of it, the history is that known that the the Navy needed to pull out. They wanted our, the U.S. Navy wanted to pull out, um, and they would leave the Marines without the supplies and all that in the food they needed. 
et cetera. And so our, so General Vandergrift found this out from Admiral Turner and he, he, it was radio silence. So he left Guadalcanal to go find Rupertus on Tulagi. So across the Sea Lark Channel, kind of got lost. Um, and basically, uh, right before he found Rupertus, they witnessed the Battle of uh, Savo Island. They're, they're um, and he, fireworks across the water. And yeah. it's the battle that's erupted with, uh, with Allied ships basically sinking and burning. It's dramatic. Uh, yeah. Anyway, we, we cover that. And uh, that's something that's gotten lost. There was a second naval battle of Savo Island when the, the Allies turned the tide against the Japanese. We lost a couple of great admirals there, including Norman Scott. But you can see here, this is where these marine transports were located right off Tulagi, which is basically a, an island off of Florida Island, a larger island. Um, but those those transports were basically s sitting ducks on those nights. And again, it's one of those things, one of those what ifs. Um, the Japanese turn around, they would inflict some damage on them. But um, as part of the rest of the story that really needs to be focused on and told. Yeah. And you can move it on if you like. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, that's okay. Okay. There's just a picture of our grandfather in the riot. There's General Vandergriff and uh, Vandergriff's chief of staff, uh, Jerry Thomas. Um, here's a picture we have. Uh, I don't know if you've seen this before, but this is a society of red tape cutters. And Dr. Seuss used to make this. And um, our grandfather and a bunch of people got these who were in the Pacific. So um, kind of a fun little piece of history. Um, the whole whole country was all in for the for the war. So here's a picture of um, Admiral Nimitz pinning the Navy Cross on General Rupertus and um, a bunch of Marines and Naval officers that were there. Again, the Army had not um, at this point come on Guadalcanal yet. Yeah. So the U.S. Army, as you know, was largely, largely um, uh, I won't say disengaged, but uh, the, the U.S. Navy Marine Corps bore the brunt of the Pacific War until MacArthur got reinvolved, um, uh, moving into the Pacific. Here's the slot we were talking about. There you see Rabul up to the left. This is where the Japanese Navy was head was uh, headquartered, and it would they would run their ships down the little. You can see a little red line in there, all the way to Guadalcanal. And they would continue to attack. Again, if you've seen, I know you just said you had seen, maybe some of your, your viewers have seen the Pacific, but the, the explosions are what we're getting. They're attacking every night, hitting that airfield to try to keep it from being built. Just another closer picture there of the Solomon Island Theater. Amy, take that one if you would. Okay, so um, after the Marines uh, when finished at Guadalcanal and Tulagi and the Army came in to relieve them, the Marines... Uh, went for R and R to Australia, and our grandfather was there. You know, almost what is it like seventy percent of the division had malaria, so uh, they needed a lot of uh, TLC to get back into training. Uh, so, meanwhile, Eleanor Roosevelt, the president's wife, decides she's going to visit. Our grandfather is his uh, her marine escort. So here's a picture of I guess her plane has landed. She's gotten in, out of the car. And he's going to escort her all around uh, for the day she's in there. And she has in her diary when she was in Melbourne. And this is uh, that day. And they went around to the Red Cross. They went to a little children's hospital to visit um, children who were ill. And uh, our grandfather brought a little koala bear to give to this little child. Again, he lost his first family. So I think he really uh, felt for this these kids. Um, so... Well, part of the rest of the story there on Eleanor Roosevelt is that her visit drove the Allied High Command bananas. They didn't want her coming in because, you know, you got to you got to spit and polish for the first lady. You got to you got to take away from military military training, et cetera. But um, it worked out well. Um, take that one, too, Amy, if you don't mind. Yeah, this is a picture. Yeah. Um, our grandfather used to write on these. <laughs> so that's his handwriting. But uh, there were these little YP boats, old tuna boats that used to go back and forth between. Guadalcanal and Tulagi, and he really loved them because uh, it was so dangerous for, for these uh, people that were these men who were going back and forth, really with not much ammunition on their boats. So he really had a special place in his heart for him. But here it is, he is uh, jumping on the boat and he's like 52 then, but he'd probably be, <laughs> it was more like 65 back then because, you know, they all smoked and drank. I mean, didn't drink maybe, but... <laughs> Smoked a lot. Um, here he is. There was a big parade in Melbourne uh, when the Marines were there. 
again, they were the the men, the troop, the men who've been away fighting came back to Melbourne and all these American Marines are there and it caused a little tension. So they, our grandfather and the uh, mayor of Melbourne, Lord Nettlebottom, worked to ease the tensions <laughs> between the men. And they ended up having a great party uh, at the cricket fields and uh, the rest is history. It worked out. So uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, this is them at the Red Cross, and she was so happy with um, how she'd been treated and really appreciated it that she wrote him a handwritten letter and said she'd help the Marines if he, you know, the, any of the officers, if they needed anything, she would um, help them if they just wrote to her. So, Which I'm going to jump in there. It, it proves he has the skills of the diplomacy and the getting on with politicians and people of other nations as well. Because again, some, some commanders of primarily combat units, not just Marines, can be a little bit blunt instruments in the sense that they're very good at commanding their men in combat, but not so good at the whining and dining, not so good at the geopolitical situation. And it seems to me he's an all rounder, which is why people in the sidebar are saying, why is he not more famous? You know, that these battles yeah. you've been pretty explained to us about Jalagi and what have you, it's so critical, the involvement, the Navy, the Marines, the, and, and this, this, this broad sweep of influence he's having. And yet for most people, he's, he's not a name that's on the top of tip of their tongues. It is fascinating. Well, yeah. Paul, just, just to follow up on that, I've described him as a cross between George S. Patton and Dwight Eisenhower because he had Eisenhower's diplomatic skills, but he was an audacious general in terms of attacking like Patton, just as we described the daring mm. uh, 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 maneuver uh, at Tulagi earlier. Uh, to answer the question, why is, he, why is he not better known? He died prematurely and for yeah. whatever reason before the war and just was picked up. This is him awarding the... Uh, uh, Medal of Honor, I believe, to John Bassalone. In, and that's um, Jesse Puller right Jesse there. Jesse Puller, my bad. Go right ahead. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I know we got to move along for time's sake. <laughs> There's so much to cover. But um, okay, so yeah, they're in Australia here and uh, they're doing awards. Uh, and here he is. He, so he had known Jesse Puller since the 20s. So here it is in, in the 40s. And um, uh, that's a whole nother history. But um, they, they had known each other for a long time. So we're moving now into Cape Gloucester. So we left Guadalcanal, Australia behind. The Marines, their next um, thing, they're back under MacArthur, or they're under MacArthur. So here's a picture. Um, our grandfather's on the right. He's pointing at something. You can see how hot it is. I love this picture because it just looks like so hot. You can just feel them in that tent, the sweat, mm. the stress. Um, and then MacArthur's looking over and they're smoking. And this is some map from, I am assuming it's Cape Gloucester. Um, so, uh, again, they're trying to squeeze her ball. Don, you want to chime in here? Yeah. And, and just to follow up, uh, the Marine first Marine division primarily is under the Navy. In fact, it was under uh, Admiral Nimitz for most of the war, but MacArthur fell in love with General Rupertus and fell in yeah. love with the Marine division and yeah. argued to Roosevelt, give me the division. So Roosevelt said, okay, you can take the division for this assault on New Britain. This occurred on Boxing Day, 1943. And of course, the idea is, you know, at the far right of New Britain, although I can't, I think no, you can see it there, is Rabul, which is where the Japanese yeah. naval base better. is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea is to attack from the other side and squeeze them. And, uh, That's a better and picture. There you go. So that shows where Rabul is. So so the, so the uh, Marines... Uh, under under General Purtis, overall under the Army now, attack at Cape Gloucester at the far uh, western uh, section of the island. And the idea was to, again, put pressure on the Japanese. In the meantime, over Bougainville, other Marine units were attacking there. So in other words, this is the noose approach for the island strategy. But uh, that will be the only time that MacArthur got the Marines because by the time uh, that, you know, by the time uh, after this battle was over, Nimitz wanted them back and got them back. But it's sort of, sort of interesting the very, very close relationship that, they, that General Rupertus had with General MacArthur and would have kept him the whole time if Roosevelt had let him keep him. So it's pretty well, interesting. But I wonder whether that close relationship with MacArthur is also something about why he's less well-known because other people would have known he's in the MacArthur camp. Because as you said yourself, I think it was you said it, Don, MacArthur's kind of seen as the army guy. Nimitz is seen as the kind of Navy, a Marine guy. And whether being kind of aligned to the other camp meant that amongst other Marines, he was like, oh, he's part of the, the competition. I, I wonder, because MacArthur, we know we've done lots of shows about MacArthur. MacArthur doesn't like people under his command stealing his limelight. Nimitz, for example, doesn't mind people under his command being part of the 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 publicity, but MacArthur wants all that for himself. You don't get to be famous under MacArthur. 
Yeah. MacArthur is one of the great studies in personalities and personalities in the history of warfare, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a whole other topic. Go ahead, Amy. I didn't mean to cut you off. Well, we have letters. So our, our father was, I mean, he, he had respect for, I mean, grandfather um, had respect for MacArthur, but he did not want, and he actually mm -hmm. said this, he didn't want, and he wrote this back to uh, uh, Vandergriff, uh, who was common at, at that point, um, that we don't want MacArthur to go through our Marines like tissue paper and and to drive them to, you know, he, he was like, because MacArthur had pushed it a little too far. And he said, that's it. You know, yeah, we're, we're not doing this. We, the letter yeah. exchanges between General Purtis and General Vandergriff on that topic are really, really, really fascinating. Uh, you know, General Purtis is going to do what the president orders, but clearly he would have preferred to remain under naval command, I believe. Yeah. Go ahead, Amy. So this picture, you know, if you've seen it in history and you just wonder what that is, unless you know, unless you know that these are Marines wading through the water off of Cape Gloucester. So there's the the coat, the foam on the water and they're wading through the muck. And then you can see, I think in the movie, The Pacific, they they show a lot of rain and how, <laughs> how miserable it was. Um, and here's, uh, you know, the, here the Marines are. And our grandfather is reading a radio from President Roosevelt here. And I read that this was the Navajo code talkers um, deciphered this. I'm assuming it had to have been in code. But anyway, he's reading. Uh, our, I know that because our grandfather wrote it on the back of uh, this picture. Here's another picture of uh, Cape Gloucester. That's Colonel Frisbee pointing our grandfather there. Another picture. So um, General MacArthur was so happy with the 1st Marine Division, he came to visit them. Um, unannounced twice. And this is one of those times. Um, okay, I was going to say something else, but go ahead. Um, so here we are in 1944. And um, our grandfather knew that, and I think everybody knew the closest we're, closer we're getting to Japan, the tougher, the tougher it's going to get. And um, the Marine had been, had been used to this, um, you know, battle plan where they would you know, land on the, the islands and the Japanese would go inland and eventually they'd meet up with them. This, everything changed at Peleliu. And um, they had changed their strategy. They were highly embedded. And most of, most of these listeners, I'm assuming, knew, know about this. But um, yeah, they were planning for a pretty normal kind of uh, assault and they were um, very surprised. And the documents from the J Japan basically said that the um, monograph that they were going to um, <clears throat> kill as many American Marines as they could um, here on Peleliu. And, and, they wanted to stop their advancement at Peleliu. And from a big picture perspective, as you know, Paul, there was a debate on Peleliu on whether to even attack at Peleliu. Yep. You know, MacArthur gave, gave his famous actual return speech and he was bound and determined to, to do that. And if you look at where Peleliu is in relation to the Philippines and Madonna, the Pele was controlled by the Japanese. Initially, MacArthur was advocating for this operation because he was concerned about the Japanese hitting him from the block from the backside when he moved in landed on the Philippines. So he was arguing for this. The Navy, uh, and the Navy wanted to basically move straight north now toward the Japanese islands to simplify things. And so the bait went back and forth and back and forth, and they finally decided to go ahead and and attack Peleliu, and of course MacArthur did land. And um, but it was a it was a bloody proposition, but it was a, an Allied victory, and the general was commended for it. But there's been a lot of uh, misunderstanding about it because, as Amy pointed out, it's the very first time the Japanese changed their tactics. The uh, g methods of gathering intelligence were very primitive compared to what we have now. You have search planes, but you may but you can't search planes can't tell you who's inside the island. So anyway, but it's uh, it was a general's final command before he, they uh, he came back to Washington, where he's going to take control of U.S. Marine schools at Quantico. Yeah, and so we um, we in researching this, you probably you they went back and forth and back and forth, and I think we were so spread spread so thin. They're at the highest oversight. This should have been gotten more attention um, mm -hmm. and to avoid this island if possible. But I don't know if it was possible because if we were going to protect, you know, MacArthur's return it, to the Philippines, it's one of those things that people debate. That in the sidebar, people are saying we should have skipped over it. But yeah. I want to just ask a little bit more about where your grandfather is, and it sounds like a crass question, but kind of mentally at this point of the war, because we did a show with Brian Izzard last week about Admiral Ramsey, who was involved from Dunkirk right the way up to Neptune and D-Day, and 
Yeah. If you're if you're in a position of command and people are dying under your command and you're going through what we know is terrible climates, terrible terrain, terrible things you're facing. You're you, you know as you said he's in his fifties. Yeah. He's been fighting and being been a marine for a long time. By 1944, approaching Peleliu, is he is he is he still got masses of reserves of of, of strength and and spirit? Do you think, Amy, or is he kind well, of running on empty a bit? Well, he um here um. Here's a picture of the USO and he's with Bob Hope. But um, I think with the training it, it, during Cape Gloucester, he went to see a, um, you know, some uh, exercise. And as he was getting back into the boat to leave, he went to grab a handle and it was canvas and it, and it tore because it was, you know, obviously uh, dried oh, out. Wow. So he fell back, landed on coral and he ended up breaking his foot. So here he is on Pavuvu, where they went after Cape Gloucester, and uh, he has a broken foot. And Vandergriff came and saw him, and he talked, but he didn't say, oh, Bill, maybe because they were on a first-name basis. It surprised me that he didn't say, Bill, maybe you should not do this one. I mean, our grandfather mm -hmm. was on crutches when uh, uh, Vandergriff vi visited Pavuvu. But Vandergriff hurt at Guadalcanal on that night when they were, he was trying to find Rupertus before the Japanese came for the Battle of Savo Island. Um, he hurt his ankle. So maybe he thought he'd be okay. I really don't know. But at this point, I think he's tired. Um, but he was, but the videos that we found, and they're on my um, YouTube page for General Rupertus, everybody looks very at ease. The officers look at ease. They're getting ready for the next battle. They're walking around. They're planning. They're smiling. Um, I'm not sure they knew. I, I really don't think they knew it was going to be as bad as it was. As, as many uh, people said, you know, we we knew we maybe we didn't think it was could be as fast as Rupertus thought, but we never thought it would be as long. And mm -hmm. and we didn't have we didn't have the foresight to know. Um, but some people thought it would be fairly quick, like tar Tarawa, um, and it wasn't. So, um, so here's where the Palus are, key points. Um, and the other thing that is interesting, there's some great research coming about out about the um, Army's uh, work on Angwar. I, and that's not really, they've really not gotten much attention about this, but they were actively engaged on Angwar during Peleliu and only a little bit of the Army could come over or only a few RCTs could, too could come over because they were so bogged down on Angwar, which, you know, maybe they shouldn't have invaded that too. They took on too much. But so they weren't, I tell people they weren't off the shore eating bonbons. They were, they were working hard the 81st and they really didn't all come over until about October 20th by the time and to relieve the Marines. And that's when uh, the first Marine division all of them left, including our grandfather and Geiger. So, um, go on and on about Palu. We already talked about that. Um, there's a situation, pictures, these are famous pictures um, mm -hmm. of Palu. Um, that, this one with the tank, I just love. There's our grandfather <clears throat> talking to some of the wounded uh, Marines. He's still got his cane there in that photo. So is that yep. stuff from the ankle? Yeah. And and I'll ask both of you, you know, Don as well. I mean, Peleliu, you I think you kind of hinted at it yourself. It, it probably was the zenith or the or the or the, the low point or the high point uh, of his career, depending on your point of view. I mean, Peleliu, whenever it comes up on World War II TV, I mean, we've had Henry Sledge on Eugene Sledge's yeah. sound a couple of times. You know, it, it's the worst bit of the war he described. And there was some horrific campaigns Marines went through in the in the Pacific, but Peleliu seems to be top of the list there. Was that your grandfather's experience? And, and Don, yeah, you I think, that um, and I, there was a uh, first Marine division veteran that I interviewed in Charlotte, uh, Jim Hunter, just a gem of a guy. And he said there were um, <laughs> Japanese, I mean, it was one-on-one. -on -one. There were Japanese everywhere. And <clears throat> I think our, I, I mean, I know our grandfather um, thought it was a hellhole. Uh, he agreed with everybody. Um, but I think to answer your question, he had, I think by this time he knew he was going to be relieved. 
Mm -hmm. um, people say, oh, he got relieved because of this. No, he knew beforehand that he would be commending the schools. Um, but he wanted to see this through. And he, he, again, he was very resolute. But I think this is the first time the Marines, you know, it was a stalemate. And I think it's the first time all of them, all the officers and the men were in a real stalemate. Um, but they ended up prevailing. And the, thank goodness the Army was there to help them, too. Um, well, it was, yeah. it, was a, it was a stalemate early on. But again, this is, as I mentioned, the first time the Japanese had changed their military tactics. You know, again, going back to what we saw uh, before at Guadalcanal, even in the Pacific, uh, General Vandegrift wades on, nobody's there. This is the first time you meet a buzzsaw up front. So it's kind of a stalemate -ish in that you're meeting an absolute buzzsaw that you're not that you're not expecting. But the other thing is, if you look at, you know, if you look at Iwo Jima in February of 1945, just a few months later, same thing with, you know, the U.S. Navy has been bombarding Iwo Jima for months, just bombing it here, bombing it there. Nobody was, people have said the same thing about Iwo Jima. They were never expecting what they saw because the Japanese came out of the tunnels and the holes. Um, had Iwo Jima, you know, had, had Peleliu come before Iwo Jima, which, which wouldn't happen because geographically it wouldn't happen, but it, yep. the, whatever battle was going to be the first battle where the Japanese changed their tactics is going to get more attention. And General Rupertus, at one point, estimated three days, and so he's gotten criticism of that. But give me a break. How are you going to know? Um, you're, you're dealing with what intelligence you have, and we did win that, and the general was commended for having won that. And so uh, it well, is what it is, and it will be debated for years to come for sure. Yeah. So here's a picture of our grandfather and some of the officers, and you can see, to answer your question, I mean, five months after this, uh, he had a heart attack and died. So he, I think he's looking really tired. You know, like you talk about U.S. presidents. <laughs> how they look after four four years, but I think he looks uh, pretty tough. Um, but he did give a commendation to the army and um, and the also the um, um, Mumford Marines, the Black Marines, our first uh, uh, Marine division that was black, and um, the War Dog platoon. Platoon. So if you know the story about the dogs on Peleliu, it's pretty um, interesting too. So. Um, Okay, we're tying this up. He comes home. He goes to Quantico. He's head of the Marine Corps schools, which is now the Marine Corps University. Um, my dad, there's my dad there. Um, he's happy to have his dad back. And um, uh, and anyway, he didn't make it. He ended up dying of a heart attack March uh, 1945. And um, uh, here you see um, they're putting up the... Um, Here's the USS Rupertus. Our grandmother is christening it in 1945. Um, uh, very young. Our dad was there for the christening. Uh, and then here is um, Colonel Ross. This is really interesting because Ross was with Rupertus in um, Peking. So here he is putting uh, the uh, flag up and um, on Okinawa. And uh, anyway, uh, it was promised this flag was on um, Cape Gouster and Peleliu, and he put it up on there. And it was on the U.S. Yes, Rupertus when it launched, but we don't know where it is now. But um, it was a promise to Rupertus by Colonel Duvalle that they would, you know, carry that flag. So all that said, all that history, and now, look, we're back in the Pacific. I mean, it just blows my mind. But I guess we should probably take it to questions. I mean, we can go into what is happening in the Pacific now, but that's probably a whole other conversation. Well, it, it kind of is another conversation. And it's one of those things that I do I do struggle with mentally and that I'm doing these shows about World War II that have so many parallels to, you know, to, to, to today's world. You know, when I, I submitted the, the chapters of my last book, you know, a year and a half ago, and I was writing about Ukraine and Kiev, and then suddenly as the, as I've submitted the chapters, those very places are now under fire and under attack again. And as you're talking about, the Pacific is you know, everything, what goes around comes around. And it is, it is interesting and, and, and saddening that these, these same things are happening, but we will do some questions now. And my first one that, that came up is, um, the, well, it's a, it's a contra Benjamin Allen, one of our viewers, bit controversial question. They didn't mention Rupertus's toxic re relationship with the 81st Division. Uh, oh, okay. What what would you be your reaction to that? I mean, there's there were some other sidebar conversations about the re the, the general kind of cooperation between the, the Marines and the Army. Um, 
obviously he's your grandfather. You, 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 this is, yeah. a, this is a book about, you know, you're celebrating your grandfather's life, but yeah. what are there aspects of where he could be a bit toxic with people? Well, I think with, well, that's the narrative, but I think that he was, first of all, he lost his first family, which I think obviously would make people a little more, maybe it's a, he had his trusted people. I don't know. I can't say, but I, I also think he, he had witnessed the Japanese. He was very resolute and, and really focused. Um, he worked with MacArthur. He had worked with the uh, army in the past. So the narrative that he was toxic or didn't want the, the um, army again, they weren't readily available. And I think from the research I've seen is that there was a little debate about when the army should invade Angwar and and that they wanted to go ahead and they didn't want to wait offshore so um too long um uh, but ultimately uh like i said they worked together and our grandfather gave the army a you know a commendation and um so i i think from what geiger's chief of staff said he felt like repertus if anything being a marine like most marines thought they could power through on the mission. Um, I, I personally think that's all that's overblown a bit. I mean, but but you go back though and you you know again the army had been out of it. MacArthur, I don't I don't mean to that in a negative way, but the fact of the matter is the Marine Corps and Navy were pressing most of the the battle. But at the time uh Peleliu comes around the, the, the plan is to get the army back. Remember they're taking Peleliu initially to cover MacArthur's back in the Philippines, just a uh, hundred or so miles across the water. And um and the plan was to get the army involved in the invasion of Peleliu earlier. And as Amy said, they were bogged down. So it's going to, you know, you run into a buzzsaw, there's going to be some natural tension there. But remember I described with Curtis as a combination between Eisenhower, the diplomatic side, and, and Patton on the aggressive side. And that, you know, that aggressive part is necessary for great generalship a lot of times. And some of it may have been stemming from that. But I, I do think that whole thing's a bit overblown. Well, thanks for both of your opinions, Dan. The thing is, you know, it's, it comes up all the time on this channel is that whenever you get figures, generals and above, there's always people who think this person was good or bad or, or indifferent and relationships. And, and that's what makes it so fascinating. And it's the, the, I was complimented in the sidebar by because I always have my guests as the focus of the history. I might do a show in one week where one presenter venerates one particular general or admiral, and then the next week, someone will say the opposite version. That's what history is. History is about opinions. It's about making a case, supporting it with your with your thought-out ideas. And the fact is, we should be talking about your grandfather more, Amy, because he, as you said there, he was involved in some pivotal battles, some amazing decisions, uh, uh, some controversial uh, uh, events at times, and and discussion leads to understanding. That's, that's kind of the thing, I think. So, um, before we kind of bring things up, I don't think we've got any more questions coming in. I think you've just covered everything very well. Um, but anything that your obviously your hopes are that people know your grandfather's story better and Don with 15 books, you've 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 been tackling various subjects from a military point of view. What are your particular hopes? I know it's been out a while for this for this book. Go ahead, Amy. I'll follow you. Um, uh, well, for me personally, when I was writing this and I, I have a little audio, but I don't know if we could play it of our grandfather speaking about the war, but um, it's only two minutes. Uh, I think for me, I felt like, gosh, these this story is not known. It's not just our grandfather's story. Again, it's these Marines story. And even Kate Gloucester, you know, there's a lot on Guadalcanal, not a lot on Tulagi and the sm smaller islands. And there's not a lot on Kate Gloucester. And these are these are big battles. Um, and then Peleliu is kind of the same story. And uh, I just felt like these, these, the military fighting in the Pacific needs more attention. You know, yeah, maybe, and I, I, maybe yeah. they didn't get it. Maybe it hasn't gotten it because it was so nasty. Um, well, and I'm, I'm viewing this just to. John, you're muted. You're muted. Yeah, you can see me talking, but I'm muted. I, I see just to follow up on that as an opportunity, Paul, to you know to fill a great historical void. I mean, you're talking about the guy who commanded the first Marine Division longer than anybody else, um, you know, who won the first battle, who wrote the Rifleman's Creed, who won the backbreaking battle in Guadalcanal. Yet there's been no biographical work, and this is just a biographical work. The book is, and I mean, it's a it's a historical book on what those Marines were doing in these battles as well. So it's one of those things, how did this get missed? 
And uh, Amy and I, it's like a match made in heaven as far as all this goes. And uh, and uh, it's her grandfather. He's a great American. He's a great uh, military uh, general. And uh, this story is one that's never been told before and is extremely significant from a historical standpoint. I'm just blessed and honored to be a part of it and grateful that Amy let me come on board with her. And I'll say one more thing. I think um, this story about the and the generals in the Pacific has only been touched on. Um, and I think uh, it's important for for more more stories to come about that, about them. So and yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, again, I'm extending from what I will continue what I was saying a minute ago is a lot of the what what we still believe about some of these Pacific theater, theater commanders is what was written perhaps in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and it needs still and a re-evaluation, the historiography of some of these incredible figures. I mean, just last year, I think two or three books came out about Nimitz, and Nimitz has had lots of, it, of, of, of biographies and assessment. But as you say, you're both of you, there are other people who haven't had much assessment at all. And an assessment means re-evaluation. It means names are being brought to the forefront. It means more stories are being told. It means more heroism is being um, ex uh, covered and, and featured, and, and that's all good. And we will never get to the bottom of, of debating why certain things happen and should they have done this and should we have gone that way? Should we have stopped there? Should MacArthur have done that? Should Patton have done that? That's what makes history fascinating, and it gives us an insight. And people were saying that right at the beginning. It's another, another view. And that's all we'll do. So I think we will bring things to an end. I will extend an invitation to both of you or either of you to come back in the future and talk about something else. We can do a deep dive on one of these aspects. But right now, it's great to bring things to an end. I'm going to just take you off screen for a second to remind folks what we've got coming up tomorrow. Then I'll bring you back to say goodbye in a second. So, folks, we have one more show in this Pacific series. Philip Bradley, who's always fantastic in Australia, is talking with us tomorrow about the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Wow. That's another uh, that's W A U, not W O W. <laughs> That is another battle of the Australians in New Guinea. So this, don't forget these events were happening at the same kind of time as the events on Guadalcanal were happening. Remember, the Solomon Islands, New Guinea, all happening at the same time. You know how good Philip Bradley is. That's tomorrow, same time. And then next week, we've got our Canadian at, uh, Canadians at War series. Some great guests coming your way, including Ted Barris and Brad Sanquois. But right now, I'm going to bring my guests back in to say goodbye and thank you. Remind everybody the links to their books and to Amy's website and there for her YouTube channel and all the other resources are in the description below and you can find these clips and these audio clips and resources and the photos far more than you share today. Uh, it's my privilege to say thank you very much and my honour to have you listening to you, fo you folks and I can't wait to see you again. Yeah, thank you. Thank so you, Paul. Thanks to your audience. It's been yeah. an honour to be with you. Brilliant. So this is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying I will see you all again tomorrow. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Whew.